Hi and welcome back. In this video we're going to go through the ideas of volumetric analysis and conducting a titration. This is an experimental technique that allows us to identify the amount of an unknown substance in solution by reacting it with another solution. For the next few minutes you'll watch through a video from the Royal Society of Chemistry that shows how a titration is conducted. In this acid-based titration, a standard solution of sodium carbonate will be used to determine the exact concentration of a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid. An indicator solution will be used to help find the end point of the titration. In this case, methyl orange will be used, which will turn from a red to yellow. Here is the equation for our reaction. Pour approximately 50 centimetre cubed of your stock sodium carbonate solution into a dry, clean beaker. Rinse the burette several times with distilled water. Using the funnel, add a little of the sodium carbonate solution to rinse through the burette above and below the tap. Discard the rinsings and repeat the step two more times. This makes sure that you do not dilute the solution when you fill the burette. Fill the burette with sodium carbonate solution above the zero mark and remove the funnel. Using the tap at the base of the burette, allow the sodium carbonate solution to flow into the beaker until the level of liquid is at or a little below the zero mark. Ensure there are no air bubbles in the nozzle. These can be removed by just running a little more solution through the tap. Next, you'll need to recall the level of the solution in the burette. It can be tricky to see the meniscus clearly. It helps to hold a piece of white card behind the burette so that it lights up the bottom of the meniscus. Take the first burette reading with the meniscus at eye level. Take a reading from the bottom of the meniscus to the nearest 0.05 centimetre cubed. Make a note of the reading. Rinse the pipette with some distilled water and then two or three times with some of the dilute hydrochloric acid solution. Rinse the conical flask with distilled water only. Using the pipette and the pipette filler, transfer exactly 25 centimeter cubed of the hydrochloric acid solution into the clean conical flask. Allow the pipette to drain for several seconds after it's been emptied. Then touch the tip against the side of the flask. Do not force the last drop of liquid from the tip of the pipette. Add two to three drops of methyl orange indicator to the flask. Take note of the color of the solution, placing a white tile underneath the conical flask to make the color more obvious. Before proceeding with the main experiment, carry out a rough titration. This is to determine roughly how much of the alkaline solution is needed to neutralize the acid and will give us an approximate value of the end point. Start by running the sodium carbonate solution quickly from the burette into the conical flask while swirling the contents. When the color change of the indicator starts to be more persistent, slow down the flow. Then start by adding 0.5 centimeter cubed at a time until the end point is reached. Swirl the flask continuously until this is achieved. Note the burette reading. Then take your conical flask, empty and wash it. And using your pipette, add a second 25 centimeter cubed sample of hydrochloric acid solution, along with those two to three drops of the methyl orange indicator. Now you're ready for your first accurate titration. As the amount of sodium carbonate required to reach the end point is now roughly known, you can start by rapidly adding the solution until the amount added is approximately 2 cm cubed from the end point. As the end point is approached, gently swell the conical flask. Then, while continuing to swell, add the sodium carbonate solution drop by drop from the burette. After the addition of each drop, rinse the tip of the burette with distilled water. Swell the flask, then rinse the side of the conical flask with further distilled water. 
When a permanent colour change occurs, note the reading. Repeat the titration until two titers agree within 0.1 cm3. Once you've recorded your data, you should have all you need to calculate the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that was the experimental procedure that we know as a titration and we used for volumetric analysis. Let's go through some of the terms and the equipment that was used in that demonstration. So, with our definition of terms, you will have seen that they were using a burette in that experiment, which was the long glass calibrated tube that delivered the variable volume. So this is the one that had the tap on the bottom that allowed the solution to go through. The pipette is the calibrated glass tube that delivers the fixed volume accurately. This is what we use to deliver the aliquot or the sample into the conical flask. This is a glass version of those squidgy pipettes you've used before in chemistry, but it provides a much more accurate and precise delivery volume. The titration is the analytical procedure where one solution is delivered via burette into another solution in order to determine the concentration of an unknown. The equivalence point is the point in the titration where the reactants have been added in stoichiometric proportions. So in the case of the reaction that we saw before, this is when there was enough sodium carbonate delivered to neutralize all the HCl, and many titrations are an acid-base reaction. The end point, however, is just after the equivalence, typically. This is where the indicator changes color in a titration. And there are a number of different indicators that we use in order to be able to determine when we have added the two um, add solutions in stoichiometric equivalence. So what we want to do is select an indicator that is as close as possible to the equivalence point to give us the most accurate analysis. Indicators we've seen a lot in chemistry already. These are weak acids where the conjugate base is a different color. So once we change the pH from acidic to basic or basic to acidic, there is a color change that is clearly observable to the human eye, which means we can use it for our analysis. The aliquot is simply the volume that is delivered by a pipette. This is a fixed volume and is what we use to deliver the solution from either our standard solution or our sample solution into the titration or conical flask. The titer is the volume that is delivered from the burette, and we will usually average three titers for a good experimental design. This means that we can minimize the effect of random error by making sure that we average the results from three titers. And with titration, we want to make sure that these values are as accurate as possible. So we average concordant titers. Concordance is where we consider a value to be within plus or minus 0.1 milliliters from highest to lowest in the range. Some textbooks will state 0.05, but we will um, at high school accept up to 0.01 between the range of titers. 0.05 mil is actually about half a drop, um, which is um, how accurate people can get with titration. So the process of the volumetric analysis, particularly for an acid-base reaction, which is the ones that we look at within the scope of this course, is as follows. We make a standard alkali solution. Sometimes it will be an acid, but we'll stick with alkali. So this is the basic solution here. We'll take a pipette and deliver a volume of around 25 milliliters. Okay, so this would be delivered by, this is what we refer to as the aliquot. And this is the fixed volume. Okay, because this is a standard solution, now we have a known volume and we would have a known concentration as well. We must add the indicator. Then we run the solution from the burette. Of course, here we need to know the reaction that would be occurring in our conical flask. Okay, we run the reaction in, making sure to make note of the initial volume, deliver that, into the titration flask until the indicator changes color. 
determine our final volume that is in our burette. And then this will mean that overall we know the volume of the titer, which is the amount that was delivered from the burette. We wash out the apparatus and we repeat several times until we have concordance. From that, we can use stoichiometry to determine the amount of mole that was delivered and the reaction that occurred in the flask. So as you saw, this is the process that is conducted through the titration. We need to fill the burette. The burette is rinsed with deionized water and then it is rinsed with the solution that it will be delivering. This is to ensure that we don't have a change in concentration of the solution that is in the burette. The pipette delivers the aliquot and should be again rinsed with deionized water and then the solution that it is to deliver. Okay. Once we have delivered the aliquot into the flask, then we add the indicator. This conical flask is rinsed with deionized water. The volume of this is never actually entered into our calculations in terms of the final volume in the conical flask. So um, we don't need to worry about rinsing this with acid or base. In fact, this must be rinsed with water so as to not any, add any extra acid or base into our analysis. We then deliver the titer, which is the volume from the burette, until the end point has been reached. And the end point is where we see the change in color. This can be done using a solid mixture. Quite often what will happen is we will have a sample that we want to dissolve and this will be dissolved up, there may be a dilution in between this step here and you need to make sure to make note of where a dilution occurs in order to be able to work out your concentrations equally uh, accurately. Sorry. Once the titration is done, this means that if our known solution was in the burette, which is quite common, and by known we mean accurately known concentration, this will often be our standard solution. Okay, so we do need standard solutions to run a titration. So if this is our accurately known concentration, once we have delivered this volume, that means that we have a known concentration and volume. So we can determine the number of mole that was delivered in the titer. Okay, from this, if we know the equation, of course we need to know the equation for the reaction that is going on in our flask, we can use this to determine the number of mole of the substance that was present in the aliquot. From that, we can work backwards, accounting for dilution to work out the number of mole that was in the sample, and therefore the concentration of the analyte that was in the original sample. We release, uh, we repeat this process, okay, making sure to rinse and have clean glassware each time until we have a series of three concordant results. Once we have that, we calculate the mean titer using only the concordant results and then move on to the mathematical part of analyzing our results using stoichiometry. Of course, this means that we will be using our concentration equation uh, or n equals c times v in order to work out these calculations. The accuracy of a titration is dependent on technique and it is important to use the pipette correctly. So this means that generally we would be practicing this technique in class. These are calibrated pieces of glassware, which means that we need to fill them until the meniscus sits just on the calibration line in order for it to be accurate. When we take readings from, it, from the burette, it's important to avoid parallax error. We read within two, two decimal places and we are estimating the second decimal place. Usually, uh, this will be, each one is a 
point one gradation and then we're estimating the distance between the two points to give us the most accurate tighter volume delivery. So for this one we can see that the meniscus falls just before at the one, two, three, fourth uh, tick on here. So it's just before 19.40. So an accurate estimation of this would be 19.38 or 19.39 milliliters as being delivered from this burette. Let's have a look at a couple of the calculations. In this case, a student was asked to perform a titration to standardize a solution of lithium hydroxide. We know that strong bases don't keep their concentration, they react with the atmosphere. So standardizing is a way in which we can accurately determine the concentration of a solution right before using it in an analysis. So we're told that she placed the lithium hydroxide into the burette. So we have a burette that is filled with lithium hydroxide and transferred a tighter volume of 20 milliliters. Sorry, transferred an aliquot into our conical flask of 20 milliliters. This is HCl that has been transferred into our flask. The concentration of the uh, HCl is known as 0 0.1148 moles per liter, and that is what we now have in the titration flask. Sodium hydroxide was run into the conical flask until a volume of 24.25 milliliters caused a color change that indicated the end point had been reached. For step one, we're asked to write a balanced equation for the reaction. So we are reacting lithium hydroxide aqueous with HCl. This of course is an acid-base reaction and we will produce lithium chloride and water. So we can see this is a one is to one ratio. We can now calculate the concentration of lithium hydroxide. The first thing we need to do is we have the concentration and volume of the HCl. So I can work out the number of mole of HCl that was present in the al aliquot. I'm going to use my n is equal to c times v. So this will be 0 0.1148 multiplied by, I need to ensure that I convert my volume to liters first. So I'm gonna divide my 20 by 1000, and that will give us a number of mole of 0 0.002296 mole. This is the number of mole that was present in the flask that was neutralized by the sodium hydroxide. So I know my HCl, I want to determine the number of mole of lithium hydroxide that was delivered. So I'm going to step across using my mole ratio. So the number of mole of lithium hydroxide is what I want, one over what I've got, which is my HCl, which is one, multiplied by the number of mole of HCl. So this means that the number of mole of lithium hydroxide is going to equal the number of mole of HCl, which is 0 0.002296 moles per uh, mole. But the question wanted us to find the concentration of the lithium hydroxide. I now have a number of mole. The tighter volume provides me with the concentration, uh, the volume. So I can work out the concentration is going to be equal to the number of mole divided by the volume, remembering again that our volume must be in liters. So we need to first divide our 24.25 by 1000 to get 0 0.02425 liters. Okay, so when we take our number of mole, 0 0.0022, Nine, six, and we divide this by our volume, we get the final concentration of lithium hydroxide in this solution is 0 0.468 moles per litre. So that is the basic process. In the next one, there's a slightly more challenging question. I would like you to look at the question answer it and then come back to see the solution. So this is the question here. 
This is determining the amount of cleaner, uh, a cleaning product, and you need to determine the amount of HCL that is present in that cleaning product. You have been provided the balanced chemical equation. So following the process that we did for the previous one, pause this video, have a go, and then come back to see the solution. Okay, so this is the solution for that titration. We had the known concentration of the sodium carbonate, so we were able to take the concentration and multiply this by the volume. This was delivered from the burette. We could then use our equation to determine the number of mole of HCl based on the number of mole of sodium carbonate. This is a two is to one ratio. So the HCl is going to be two times the number of mole of sodium carbonate, which gives us this value here. Then we can determine the concentration in the aliquot, remembering this is the bit that was delivered by the pipette into the conical flask as a 0.138 molar concentration. This question did have a dilution in it, which means we need to consider the fact that the 10 mil was diluted to 250. So this means that we need to use C1V1 equals C2V2 in order to determine the initial concentration in the cleaning product. Okay, then the last question asks is why did the analyst dilute the cleaner rather than use the cleaner as a concentrate? And this is because if we had it at the strong concentrated amount, we would require too much volume to be delivered in the concentration making A, the analysis take too long, and B, we would have to refill the burette, making it less accurate. Okay, I'd like you to have some practice with this. Remember, you do need to be able to look at the process itself, as well as being able to do the calculations. And we will discuss sources of possible error in these the next time we're in class.